So, uh, first of all, uh, a big thanks uh, to uh, Hocam, Mihriban Hocam, uh, and uh, dear Güneş uh, for organizing this lecture series. Um, thanks to you, we were able to stay connected for the last two years and stay connected uh, with people, friends, uh, researchers of the Neolithic. And it's a true honor for me to be able to present uh, this talk uh, in the memory of Ofer Bar Yosef. Um, today, um, I will try to take you to Western Turkey and to the Aegean uh, together. And uh, we'll try to sort of um, discuss uh, the latest uh, evidence and um, some thoughts um, that, uh, that is related to the neolization process of Western uh, Anatolia in relation uh, to Southwest Asia. So the major um, topics I would like to um, address uh, or the questions I would like to ask are uh, listed here. Um, first of all, I would like to emphasize that we still have a huge um, uh, research gap uh, in the area and um, all the interpretations or hypotheses we formulate needs to need to rely on uh, still um, poor uh, data and there is still so much uh, to do in the sense uh, to understand the process of neolization um, from the late Pleistocene into the early Holocene. Um, the neolization of Western Turkey, uh, like anywhere in any region uh, in Southwest Asia, is a unique um, historical process. It is um, non-linear, it is non-teleological, um, and it has all sorts of backs and forths, uh, and the groups are flexible and fluid. So this will be one of the major points uh, I, will, uh, I would like to make uh, during my talk. Um, another question I would like to ask, whether we have the kind of sedentary foragers in Western Turkey, similar uh, to the ones we have in other regions like in Central Anatolia or in Southeast Anatolia. So in this critical interface between Pleistocene, Holocene, is it possible to talk uh, about um, uh, sedentary foraging uh, groups in our region? Um, well, I will try to make the point uh, also, again, relying on uh, new and old uh, data uh, from Anatolia, um, whether we can establish again, 9th, 8th millennium BC in Western Turkey um, as a period where West Anatolian groups co-evolved, co-created, co-existed uh, with Southwest Asian cultures. So can we, in fact, um, establish uh, a connection uh, here. And then I will move on to the better known uh, uh, temporal horizon for the neolization of Anatolia. And this is the period of early seventh millennium BC. This is better researched, better published. And then we can actually here um, identify um, both patterns and also variability uh, at different sites in Western Turkey, plus uh, the Aegean. Uh, we will uh, discuss a little bit about this. And uh, I would like to ask uh, whether we can identify any Mesolithic legacy uh, in the uh, Neolithic of Western Anatolia. Uh, so here, this is a very big uh, question and it's very difficult to answer, um, but it's still, I think it needs to be asked uh, and we will see whether the current um, archaeological evidence show uh, any Mesolithic uh, sort of cultural component uh, that persists into the Neolithic period. Uh, and then I will 
uh, zoom out a little bit uh, to try to see the um, paths of dispersal and interaction uh, in the seventh uh, millennium BC. Uh, and I will try to uh, define the different stages of Western Anatolia uh, in order for us uh, to discuss uh, after the talk. Um, well, uh, the West Anatolian Neolithization is very much dominated by two um, opposing views. Uh, one is the autochthonous view, obviously, and the other is the diffusionist view. And these two um, ideas or these two different ways of uh, approaching the Neolithization problem, uh, in fact, um, created very high quality research and uh, very many discussions that uh, served uh, the discipline and the uh, neolization discussion. So um, I see this opposition uh, as some sort of a, a positive uh, practice uh, in archaeology and especially in Neolithic uh, archaeology. Uh, and this dialectical opposition uh, then uh, created us, in fact, uh, many possibilities. Uh, now uh, we sort of uh, over the years uh, in West Anatolian Neolithic, it's like almost 30 years now, uh, but it goes way back uh, in fact. Uh, now we can talk about many different possibilities of uh, Neolithization. Uh, and uh, Marek Zivelebil called this the integrationist view where both autochthonous and diffusionist components uh, may uh, come together or exist together uh, uh, in different regions and different areas. Okay, uh, well, um, as I said before, there's still so much uh, to do uh, in this part of the world for understanding the neolization process. Uh, until very, very recently, as you can see on this map from Kozlowski 2016, uh, West Anatolia is a huge uh, empty uh, space, uh, a true terra incognita in terms of especially um, epipaleolithic uh, research. So um, we had only Ökuzini and we had Balkan epipaleolithic, etc., and obviously Natufian, etc. But here, what's going on in Western Anatolia was a big uh, mystery. So. Uh, we had no archaeological, solid archaeological evidence to rely on. Um, uh, there is, of course, there's a lot of uh, progress, but uh, in this uh, graph, I try to show and compare the situation uh, in a way uh, between mainland Greece, Aegean Islands, and Western uh, Anatolia. And we have huge, huge um, chronological gaps still uh, that needs to be filled. Uh, in order for us to, you know, uh, formulate better uh, narratives about the neolization. Uh, new projects uh, contributed a lot, and I will talk about them, uh, but still uh, we lack um, many, um, uh, many uh, temporal horizons uh, in between. Uh, so it looks like there's still so much uh, to do in this sense. Also in the Aegean, but it looks much better uh, than Western Anatolia, uh, at least. All right. Um, in the last years, uh, we had a lot of uh, new uh, projects, fieldwork uh, conducted all over Turkey, and some of the more exciting ones, you know, they contributed so much uh, to an, our understanding of the craniolithic uh, sequences uh, in Turkey, and especially here in Western Turkey. Um, Karaburun, Bozburun, and uh, new excavations at Kuzulin, Eşek Teresi, uh, these all opened uh, us a uh, new understanding of uh, epipaleolithic in western parts uh, of Turkey, and they are very uh, welcome uh, in this sense. Uh, also in Neolithic research, we have very new uh, contributions, and they're also very uh, exciting. Uh, from uh, Cappadocia to, again, to Ayos Petros. Uh, we have new research, uh, new research at old sites and new research at new sites. And these 
uh, all also contributed immensely uh, to our understanding of the West Anatolian and uh, slash Aegean uh, nail observation. So uh, most of the uh, uh, nail observation questions that I asked today and will discuss together, the, they rely on these uh, wonderful uh, research done recently and which are still uh, continuing. All right. Now, um, what we have learned from this research, I would like to first concentrate on two sites, uh, which uh, we discovered uh, during our surveys uh, in Karaburun uh, Peninsula. So Karaburun uh, is, a, is a very rugged uh, terrain uh, located in the province of Izmir, uh, it's one of the most westernmost points of Turkey, and it's um, located right across uh, the island of Chios and a little bit to the south uh, of the island of Lesbos in the eastern uh, Aegean. So this was an area that was not researched before, uh, and our surveys here uh, discovered uh, multiple open-air uh, prehistoric sites. Uh, including the two sites I will now, uh, I would like to now uh, introduce. Uh, one is uh, Kojaman. Uh, Kojaman is in the southeast of the peninsula and it's an open air site located today, at least on right on the coast. And we found here a very dense um, concentration of uh, lithics uh, on the surface. And these were all produced uh, from a local church, and they all had uh, white patina on them. Uh, and we had all sorts of products uh, from coarse to chips. Uh, and uh, when we studied uh, the material, we saw that we are uh, confronted with a homogeneous industry uh, based uh, on um, microlithic uh, production. And these were mostly produced from uh, blade cores, uh, as you can see here uh, on the slides. And uh, there were also a lot of uh, retouched tools, uh, including uh, burins and scrapers, uh, as well as uh, uh, geometric microliths like uh, lunates. So this uh, was at that time in 2016, when we first discovered the site, this was the first um, epipaleolithic looking uh, assemblage uh, in Western Turkey. And when we wanted to compare this with other sites, we had to turn uh, to the Aegean and to Ökuzini. So these were at that time, the two areas where we, can, uh, where we could actually um, compare. So, um, it turned out that the uh, Kojaman industry is, uh, uh, is indeed very reminiscent of the Uriakos uh, site on Lemnos, uh, which was uh, radiocarbon dated. So it was possible for us at least to suggest uh, that these two sites could be more or less contemporary. And recently, more epipaleolithic sites have been found and discovered. Uh, Dikili is one of them, uh, again, with microliths and uh, geometric microliths, uh, as well as we listened from Burcin Erdo, also in Girmelar cave, a similar assemblage is uh, discovered. So now we have a better understanding uh, of uh, at least what the chip stones uh, look like in this region, and we know that the area was um, heavily uh, populated by epipaleolithic uh, foragers, and the industry is very much related to the um, other known uh, geometric microlithic industries of, uh, of uh, the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, the second site uh, I would like to uh, introduce is called Kayadivi, also from Karaburun. Uh, this is another open air site with a lithic uh, scatter. Um, here we found um, um, again um, uh, a lithic industry, but uh, this time uh, not microlithic. It was it looked very different from everything we have seen 
uh, in Western Turkey, and uh, it was very difficult to understand what kind of technology uh, this was at the first place. Uh, and um, it, uh, it, was a, it was an industry that was produced on local uh, chert. Uh, and most of the time uh, we had um, we had flake cores and also a lot of unretouched um, flakes, uh, as well as a uh, few uh, retouched tools like uh, notches or um, denticulates um, or end scrapers, etc. So this looked very different uh, from the uh, Kojaman site, which we had, and we compared uh, this site again uh, with the better known examples and assemblages from the Aegean. Um, and uh, in comparison, um, the, um, the um, uh, Aegean Mesolithic uh, sites on the Aegean islands like Marulas, Kerame, or Cave of the Cyclope, uh, in terms of typology and technology, it looked very similar to those sites, and we suggested that um, this Hayadibi uh, assemblage with its uh, flake-based uh, components and this ad hoc production uh, should be contemporary, uh, more or less, with the Aegean Mesolithic. So um, this was very important for West uh, Anatolian prehistory because we had, uh, in fact, until then, no idea what was going on just before uh, the Neolithic in the area. Um, although we didn't, we don't have absolute dates from Kayadibi, we cannot say that it's the uh, immediate uh, predecessor of the Neolithic. It could be much, much uh, earlier in the Mesolithic, but now we can say that Western Anatolian lithic tradition was very much uh, in uh, accordance with the Aegean island, uh, type of tradition during uh, the early uh, Holocene. Okay. Um, now coming to this uh, very critical uh, time period from the 10,000 to the 8,000 BC, uh, this is in fact when uh, in Southwest Asia, we see the first uh, sedentary uh, populations uh, still foraging, but also sort of uh, experimenting with plants and animals and starting to manage uh, some of the uh, animals and cultivate some of the plants. Um, so here there's one important point I want to make, and this is about a cuisine. Um, reading the seasonality uh, reports and faunal reports and floral uh, reports from a cuisine, um, it's it is uh, very much established that uh, around 12,000 BC, the case is, um, is uh, settled uh, at least uh, for multiple seasons. And um, again, the seasonality uh, research shows that it is possible that the cave was inhabited year around. So um, in under uh, optimal, uh, ecological conditions, uh, like around the warm uh, phase of uh, 12,000 uh, BC, uh, the groups uh, in Western Anatolia um, were able to, you know, switch to a broad spectrum economy and stay in places for multiple seasons, if not uh, for uh, the whole year. Uh, and this is one thing we learned from Ökuzini, so it's not uh, this, you know, the sedentary behavior or sedentism is not something so foreign, uh, perhaps, uh, to the communities in Western Turkey. So this is one possibility maybe we can uh, keep in mind uh, at this stage. The other sites, Marulas and Girmelar, uh, I compared some uh, futures and tried to see whether, you know, they're um, uh, similar to each other. And in fact, uh, they are, they both have uh, some of the features of what we associate with uh, Aegean Mesolithic and some of the features that we uh, relate to Southwest Asians slash Anatolian uh, um, 
futures, uh, but still uh, they are very similar uh, to each other in many ways. Uh, one thing uh, that Girmeler stands out, uh, I think, is the um, is the mud-based uh, architecture. This is something we do not see uh, in Marulas, uh, where we have the round stone architecture. So this uh, mud-based architecture may be related to uh, Southwest Asian uh, Neolithic, um, and here including, you know, like Central Anatolian or Southeast Anatolian uh, Neolithic. This is not something that uh, was um, independently um, sort of invented here, but it could be that it's it is an sort of a non-local uh, component, cultural component that. Uh, came to the region around uh, late ninth uh, millennium BC. So this can be one of the discussion uh, points here. Um, another important um, indication, uh, again, for non-local uh, appearance of uh, futures here in this region uh, are the, um, is the occurrence of non-native uh, species. And especially here, we have some evidence from plants. And uh, this goes uh, hand in hand with the central Anatolian sites, like in Bonjuklu, uh, where we have the emmer reed uh, in the late ninth uh, millennium BC, or at Ashiklu, we have the uh, new gloom reed uh, type. And also at Girmelar, we are told that there, there is wild barley and gloom reed. Um, so, this could be the, you know, the time period where um, Neolithic and Epipaleolithic or Mesolithic, let's say, for the Aegean um, futures or components come together or merge together. And this, this gives us the real time period where uh, new uh, encounters uh, are happening in this region. And we can also include perhaps Marulas here. And this can be discussed, uh, but uh, Marulas may also be part of this uh, greater pattern. And when we uh, move in time, when we come to Ulujak 6, Shukuri uh, 13, uh, we see that uh, many futures uh, are, uh, have disappeared. And what we have is the more pure uh, Neolithic appearance. Um, so in this sense, I think uh, Girmelar uh, is very, very important uh, for understanding. Uh, this uh, late ninth millennium uh, sort of uh, transition and occurrence of first early um, uh, Neolithic uh, elements uh, in the region. And here, uh, if I'm allowed, uh, I would like to open a parenthesis or, or footnote about uh, Hajular. Um, as uh, you know, uh, Melart uh, talked about basal hajular and he called it a ceramic hajular. And he excavated seven different uh, layers from this, uh, uh, from this earliest levels. And he uh, discovered uh, buildings uh, with red plaster floors and skull depositions on virgin soil, etc. cetera. Uh, and we have one uh, single radiocarbon date from the site which is usually discarded as unreliable uh, because of the high, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the time range it provided, and it's one of the earliest um, radiocarbon dates. Uh, but still, considering with the new data emerging uh, from the Aegean and from Western Turkey, I think still there is uh, some potential in uh, reconsidering basal hajular as part of this uh, late ninth millennium. Uh, neolithization um, uh, process. So um, there is, I think, still some merit uh, here where we can turn back uh, to basal hajular in this sense. All right. Um, uh, the key points until now, um, I think we can uh, think about some sort of sedentism emerging, uh, perhaps uh, by some groups at least, uh, in south, uh, on the southern coast of Turkey. And here, Ökuzine uh, is, is the base uh, for me. Uh, we see that the groups are very much able to switch uh, back and forth uh, between 
um, broad spectrum and more specialized hunting and um, between multi-seasonal occupations to seasonal occupations. Uh, so there is no linear uh, development here. It, it just, uh, it's a cultural choice basically uh, for the groups to remain in one place for a longer time period and or not, or uh, also the ecological conditions are playing obviously uh, a role. But for Western Turkey, we can think that maybe sedentism or uh, uh, some sort of uh, sedentarizing behavior existed before uh, the Neolithic. Uh, the epipaleolithic Mesolithic transition is very problematic. We do not really understand this in the Aegean. This is also one of the non-linear uh, developments here. There is a, a very abrupt uh, break uh, in the lithics, at least. And we do not really know what's going on at this stage. Uh, and Aegean Mesolithic is very peculiar. It's very idiosyncratic. It's, very, it's different from everything else. And we now know that West Anatolian mainland was also part of this uh, greater uh, Aegean uh, culture complex. Um, the non-native species, uh, they occur in Anatolian, Central Anatolia and Western Anatolia, perhaps uh, around the late ninth uh, millennium BC. And this, this seems like a, a key uh, time period for understanding uh, the early dispersal uh, in the region. Uh, and mud-based architecture may be here uh, seen as, a, um, as an indication of Southwest Asian traits uh, appearing uh, in Western Turkey. And um, many encounters must have taken place between the local Aegean slash West Anatolian groups and groups that uh, bring uh, some of the Southwest Asian, Asian futures or other Anatolian futures into the area. Uh, so uh, this was um, probably uh, a period of, you know, um, deep, uh, um, intense interaction among uh, different kind of uh, groups uh, that created uh, this um, local sort of uh, neolization process. The next um, stage, in a way, is very much well known, and we already heard uh, uh, at least uh, this from uh, from Barbara Horaj um, uh, about the uh, Chukurichi's earliest devils, also for Ulujak. Uh, this is the uh, this is the time period that is uh, very much defined by the uh, temporal consistency in radiocarbon dates. Uh, we have this, um, this these few centuries where many new sites are established across Western Anatolia and the Aegean. Uh, and these uh, include uh, Ulujak, Chukurichi, also Urlu <clears throat> produced a very similar time horizon. Um, we can include Bademaju, Barchun, and new excavated sites like Bahçelevler uh, in Bilecik. Um, so uh, I don't think this is a random uh, occurrence. I think this is all consistent in itself uh, and uh, sort of in a very rapid uh, way from 7000 to 6600 BC, uh, new sites are established in Western Turkey. And one point here I would like to make again is about Ökuzini Cave. Um, we know Ökuzini is an epipaleolithic site, but it also had Neolithic levels. And these were mixed, so uh, they are not really well known, but uh, two radiocarbon dates uh, on uh, domestic uh, plants uh, from Ökuzini Cave uh, produced, um, uh, produced measurements that match so well with this rapid dispersal event. So they also uh, correlate uh, very well with the other uh, sites, key sites that I mentioned. Uh, so this would uh, sort of uh, gives us an advantage uh, for identifying a maritime uh, connection uh, between Yumuktepe and Ökuzini. So these are contemporary sites uh, which have domesticated um, plants and they were, you know, um, inhabited uh, by groups um, possibly uh, moving along uh, the coast of southern 
Turkey. So that's why I include Ökuzini and Yumuktepe also here in this list uh, to see that these, um, these, uh, this dispersal uh, can be followed in many uh, places. Okay. So the, uh, the consistency is also seen in the material culture and also in subsistence strategy. Um, um, in the earliest levels of both Ulujak and Chukurici, we see all four domestic animals appearing together at the same time. Sheep, goat, pig, cattle, all four together uh, and hunting. Uh, uh, plays a very little role at this uh, earliest uh, period. Uh, we also have the domestic cereals and fossils. We have the mud base, straight to linear architecture, red plaster floors, very common to the region. Uh, and we learned from Bogdan and Milic that pressure napping is appearing here in the region uh, in the earliest levels uh, at Tukurici 13. Uh, and this is a technology uh, that, um, that did not exist before the Neolithic in the region. Uh, one can also say the same for sickle elements, the disc beads and spawn bracelets, and no pottery or few pottery uh, appeared here. So the consistency here can be followed at two key sites, but also can be uh, expanded to other areas mm, like uh, the uh, Aegean. And here, I think one very important key site, obviously, is the Frank D. Cave. And some of the latest research uh, from the site shows us that there is no gradual uh, change from the Mesolithic into the initial Neolithic. So no gradual change from a forager uh, way of living into the farmer herder way of living. Um, we see now a temporal uh, perhaps a break of 100 to 200 years between the final Mesolithic into the initial Neolithic. And also in terms of faunal assemblages, we see that there's a very abrupt um, change in the subsistence uh, strategy with uh, the initial Neolithic. We suddenly see all four domestic animals together appearing at the Frank the Cave, uh, sheep, goat, pig, and cattle all present, and there's no more fishing, uh, etc. Uh, one little detail may be uh, from uh, Mundra and Steiner's uh, article on Frank the uh, fauna, uh, initial Neolithic fauna. Uh, they indicate that um, the sheep uh, at Frank the, and sheep is a non native animal of the Aegean, it's definitely coming from outside. The individuals that were brought to Frank were very small, uh, and these were already morphologically domestic, uh, but uh, also smaller than all the other uh, known sheep uh, from South Asia. And with Ulujak, they show, uh, they correspond really well, and they're both uh, at the same, uh, they give the same measurement in a way. Uh, and Mundro and Steiner indicate that uh, this could be related to the difficulty in sort of transferring these animals and uh, perhaps uh, smaller individuals were selected uh, for a sea transport, which is which we think is possible for uh, Frankti. Another site, Knossos, where uh, Nikos F. Stratiu uh, also recently excavated and um, provided us in, um, uh, updated information about the earliest layers. And here again, I would like to emphasize that uh, all four uh, domestic animals plus the plants are present from the very beginning onwards in their morphologically uh, domestic um, states. So when we compare all these uh, key sites uh, that uh, all fall between these uh, between this uh, temporal horizon of uh, 7,000 to 6,600 BC, um, we see that they uh, they correlate so well with each other in terms of their key uh, elements. Um, uh, from architecture to subsistence uh, to technologies and uh, to symbolic items. So uh, again, and we see a very, um, I think a meaningful and non-random uh, pattern here. Uh, 
e, badem ağacı olacak and çukur içi western at all insides especially uh, they share a lot of elements here while uh, knossos and frankti the aegean uh, sites um, they are different uh, from the western Anatolian sites and they do not have some of the components that we have seen uh, at western Anatolian sites like uh, for instance plaster floors uh, red plaster floors uh, they do not appear in the aegean so uh, this shows that you know beyond uh, patterning there is also variability and different sorts of elements uh, uh, making their ways to different parts uh, of the Aegean around the same time. Okay, one important question and um, the answer, I don't know, I would love to discuss this with you. Um, is there any Mesolithic uh, legacy in the Aegean Neolithic? Uh, this is obviously very difficult to answer because we lack so much evidence and I see Nico smiling. <laughs> and um, we have this, you know, at least in Western Anatolia, we have huge chronological gaps and it's impossible for us right now to see whether some sort of, or some of the Mesolithic futures, technologies, ideologies, whatever um, persisted uh, into the Neolithic. Uh, when we look at the situation right now, I find it very difficult uh, to see any corresponding uh, features that appear both uh, in Aegean Mesolithic and initial Neolithic. Um, but you know, this can be discussed, and this is uh, this is one thing we really need to work more uh, on in future, I guess. All right. Um, as I said, when I um, sort of zoom out and try to see um the sort of the dispersal ways and routes um i believe there is a coastal route uh, that operated um in the southern uh, turkish coast um uh, and yumuktepe and Öküzini in this sense uh, gives uh, a two connection points and there but there must be more in between and in between is really very very important um, for future research. Uh, obviously, it's these routes, I think, existed well before uh, the Neolithic, uh, and they do not uh, stop at, uh, at the Turkish border. Uh, so they do uh, continue all the way to the Levant. But I mean, this can be, of course, developed by this uh, focus on, uh, on Anatolia and Western Anatolia. Uh, Girmelar, I think another uh, maritime uh, point and another uh, place where people would uh, reach more easily via uh, maritime travel uh, instead of uh, from inland, but we do not know, but this is a very rugged uh, mountainous region. It seems like uh, these coasts um, functioned really well uh, and uh, facilitated a much more rapid dispersal for Neolithic uh, to reach and many components of the Neolithic that reach the Western Turkey are not found uh, in Central Anatolia. Uh, this is this was one of the reasons why uh, uh, first the zooarchaeologists and many archaeologists suggested that you know Çatalhöyük or Central Anatolia is not uh, the place where West Anatolia Neolithic was coming from. So the, the alternative route uh, was maritime and this uh, created a much rapid dispersal and interaction uh, for people uh, in many, in all directions uh, here. Um, and for the Aegean, um, we do not know how this uh, really operated, but I believe both maritime and land routes uh, were possible here, and especially when one considers the West Anatolian uh, river basins uh, that are um, oriented east and west, like Gedis Basin or Kütükmenders, uh, Büyükmenders, etc. The, this could uh, well connect the inner western Turkey with the coastal areas. So both maritime and land routes, and much more that which I show here. Uh, was uh, actively used uh, during the seventh millennium uh, BC, if not uh, earlier. All right. 
to um, to conclude, I think we can um, now with the new research, um, one can stretch the neo station process back uh, to the ninth millennium BC. Uh, and we do not know really well what's going on in the early ninth millennium BC in West Anatolia, uh, but the possibility of sedentary foragers uh, appearing uh, based on uh, the data from both Marulas and Ökuzini. So this at least appears as, an, uh, as a possibility for us uh, to consider. Uh, late ninth millennium BC seems to be the uh, seems to be the um, the, the the critical uh, centuries where uh, this non-native elements appeared for the first time in Western uh, Anatolia, and we still know very little about this uh, time period. Uh, but uh, as I said, if we reconsider Hajilar and we uh, uh, we take the evidence from new sites like Girmelar and other uh, research, then we can say that uh, the nail station process is stretching um, back uh, to the ninth millennium BC. And what we previously called as pioneer settlements were in fact, maybe the time period when Neolithic was really established uh, in this region. And uh, this, the dispersal event, uh, I call it's rapid because of the maritime uh, and uh, land travel um, was, uh, is archeologically much more visible. And it was much uh, easier uh, to sort of identify this at the mound sites and their basal layers uh, almost always uh, contained this early uh, horizon. And after 6,500 BC, uh, we have a lot of uh, sites, uh, a lot of new established sites. And what we traditionally associate with Anatolian Neolithic, uh, in fact, appears in West Anatolia in this later uh, phase. Uh, and after a, a period of cultural uh, and economic stability, uh, an abrupt uh, abandonment of sites appear around um, 5,800 BC. Uh, and the reason uh, is, is still unknown, uh, but this is a region-wide uh, pattern. Uh, all sites uh, in Western Anatolia are abandoned. Almost all of them are abandoned uh, at this stage. And this uh, Neolithic uh, stability comes to an abrupt end. And this is perhaps the, the, the time period where we can end uh, the Neolithic uh, process and something uh, very new and very different uh, starts uh, afterwards. Um, I would like to uh, finish with these thoughts and thank all of you uh, for your um, attention. Excellent. Thank you very much, Silla. Thank you. Excellent, and ex excellent talk and also a very coherent picture you, you try to, to paint. And uh, you know, there are many, you so many, 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 many questions. I suppose there are many people. I hope so. <laughs> many people will, will have to, they would want to ask you uh, more questions, uh, I suppose, and uh, contribute to the discussion. Uh, this very very interesting discussion um who wants to start by asking to the uh, can i can i can i start uh, myself uh, sure. okay, <laughs> okay. Um, it's uh, Tiller, uh, it, it was interesting. You mentioned uh, the word uh, histor historical, uh, historical uh, dynamics or something like that. I don't remember very well. Well, for many, for many archaeologists, uh, history is, is not part of our uh, discipline. Okay, it, it, it's for many people, are, it's, an, it's, it's an anathema. 
But I agree with you that uh, we have to try to understand these uh, the historical dy dynamics of each period, and uh, ultimately try to decide uh, the way to as as archaeologists to to treat these uh, historical dy dynamics. And uh, as Ofe used to say, you end up with, uh, you know, by, by asking the big why question, why these things happen. I remember of uh, saying that all the time, every time the discussion came up, up to the big picture. So Absolutely. What... <laughs> the, the word historical uh, was not there. Uh, I mean, it was intentionally there. Uh, oh, good. That's intentional good. choice. <laughs> and, That's good. Um, that's good. As uh, we are trying to understand this uh, process, yes, it is a historical process, and uh, so much um, this nonlinearity and contingency no. is interesting. I find it. And I completely. Agree. Regions, I um, completely agree with what you said about nonlinearity and fluidity of events. I I fully agree with that. Uh, the question is whether. The answer to these, uh, to that non-linearity and fluidity, ends up in uh, the local versions of, of of stories, the local version of what happened in different different places. I, I, I'm not sure if um, the local version of events is uh, is the answer to this uh, this historical dynamism. What do you think? Uh, Absolutely. I think uh, Western Anatolian Neolithic, well, this is something uh, we thought we understood. And, uh, you know, until 1995, uh, we actually mm -hmm. had no idea what was going on. And we had to rely on Hajilar and mm -hmm. the surveys of David French. And we always yeah. had to sort of correlate it with what is known in Lake District, etc. And as we, uh, you know, um, learn more about uh, what's going on in the area and now in much no local picture emerges and I think it's inevitable in a way every site is unique uh, but also every region is unique and uh, the patterns we would like to impose on the region they are not uh, so valid uh, anymore uh, and pre-neolithic uh, sequence uh, as well as the neolithic sequence now contributed so much to this uh, understanding yeah. and it's much more exciting uh, right now in fact mm, and now we so, know what we don't know <laughs> yeah yeah in, in that context we, we need more sites and we need uh, well dated sites and safe uh, context absolutely yes okay. a continuing problem uh, which i yeah also yeah. highlighted you know uh, there's still so many unknown unknowns <laughs> The other thing, I don't want to monopolize the discussion, but, uh, you know, the other thing which worries me is um, we rely, perhaps we rely too much on generic lithic types. Mm. And, mm. And, and we think that this is the answer. Mm. But, but this is not always the case. Yes. Uh, well. dif different, different kind of sites, they have, they decide to do different things. In terms Absolutely. of lithics, in yeah. terms of lithics, yeah. The problem is most of the time all we have is lithics, and um, ah. you know, no. I mean, think about my survey. I only had lithics to work with, and I had to, you know, reach my conclusions based on the typology and technology mm, yeah, of yeah. lithics. And I had no other evidence to support, you know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I wish. We had all of the Mesolithic uh, assembled with us, and then we will we would have have had yeah. uh, much more reliable, uh, more uh, yeah. let's say we could have established what a lifestyle looked like. Um, this is a problem. I agree, uh, but still, uh, when you compare the Aegean uh, in many cases with other regions. It still has uh, has its consistency and has its uh, homogeneous uh, appearance. So, at least for the Mesolithic, it looks um, very possible to do such mm. uh, connections. Uh, mm -hmm. But I agree totally. You know, um, 
not always rely on the analytics. They may mislead you. Yes, this is one lesson we need to keep in mind. I agree totally. Because, uh, you know, the lithic experts uh, are sometimes uh, over happy to say, oh, listen, this is a Mesolithic tool, tool type. And that's no enough. No comment. It's <laughs> enough for them. But as, as you know, this is, it is, this is never the but case. But they know things. <laughs> anyway, I don't want to monopolize the, yeah. as I said. I think discussion. Mary is. Who, who else was? Yes, Mary Steiner. Yes. Thank well, you. Well, Gilair, um, very, very nice talk and extremely informative. I'm sure Natalie is here, all ears as well. Um, the, I, I was wondering in the comparison of what Frank the appears to have lost relative to um, the uh, Aegean on the Turkish side, on the Eastern side, and uh, you know, General uh, Anatolia and more specifically, um, most of those differences are essentially architectural, at least from my point of view. And one could think since um, cases such as Frankthe are kind of colonial phenomena in the Neolithic and they're very small, really small communities, kind of maybe even living a little bit on the edge that one can think of some of these, um, uh, the lack of certain um, indicators that you, you track as an attenuation of uh, the technological traditions in the sense that, um, they, they could easily have started out with these kinds of knowledge bases or traditions, mm. but quickly abandon them because, you know, the, the area around Frankthe is a really rocky place. And yes, there is mud, there is agricultural soil, but not a lot. Mm -hmm. And so honestly, even if they had that tradition arriving, they would, they'd be forced to quickly abandon mud brick architecture of any kind it just doesn't even make sense there yeah. Yeah. so i'm not surprised i mean that they could still have that in their their heritage but they just it just doesn't make any sense at all to continue it rock-based architecture makes a lot more sense mm -hmm. and they might pack it with mud but they wouldn't do mud brick the mm -hmm. other thing though is really uh striking and that's the the we don't really see the plaster you know the the lime plaster mm -hmm. traditions continuing um, because they certainly have a lot of limestone they could burn there and make plaster. On the other hand, again, this is a very small community. Uh, probably resources are being used very, very carefully. And because uh, some of their supply lines are clearly maritime, including you know, perhaps the refreshing of sheep stock, mm -hmm. they may not be using fuel in that way. They may simply not want to, I mean, because Plaster production is so expensive. Yes. And yet you see later in, in um, uh, I'm not an expert on this, but later in um, the Greek Neolithic, plaster resurfaces. But I, I just think that these early communities are living according to some, some very tough constraints. And so you don't necessarily see them um, investing in really costly technologies that are just locally don't make a lot of sense for them. Mm -hmm. So I, I do wonder if that's part of the explanation for the absence of certain criteria, even though um, I think that they, these people did trace their heritage to somewhere on this um, uh, eastern side of the Aegean. Mm -hmm. oh, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's a possibility. Um... But I tend to associate uh, these red plaster floors a bit with ideology and symbolism. And um, I don't know, we could discuss this, but this, this would be one thing that you wouldn't want to leave behind maybe, or um, maybe you could replace it with something else. And we don't know what happened, what the community in Frankfurt did. And yes, uh, Frank, the, we know from the sheep, but also from other components, you know, they were struggling perhaps with some sort of local adaptation and they had to, as you said, I agree totally, they had to leave behind some of the uh, heritage they were bringing with. Uh, but also for Knossos, we don't see red plaster floor. So what would be the reason there? They had the um, fertile land, they had the clay, they had the uh, limestones, as far as I know. Um, uh, maybe Nikos could uh, add here. 
um, why did they uh, leave behind uh, this important uh, ideological uh, component? So, I mean, this is a very big puzzle also for me why it, it was but, still but, but, in but, Anatolia, but not, uh, not uh, sort of infiltrating. But Chile, perhaps uh, it was not for them. Uh, it has not, not an ideological content. Why we perhaps think? Not. What, why we think always in these terms? Why? Uh, because uh, <laughs> I believe this is a this is a special technology. Okay. Uh, it is not something that you would use in all of your buildings. Okay. It it has a very very uh, labor intensive uh, production stages, and uh, you paint it with red. And I think red color has uh, is a symbolic. Uh, uh, meaningful um, for these communities. And based on uh, the data from Anatolian Neolithic and the, uh, the special uh, appearance of these buildings, um, I think it's, it's feasible that this is something uh, ideological, mm -hmm. but, you know, okay. um, with question mark, of course, uh, with question mark. But, um, but uh, uh, talking about the things they left behind, uh, while traveling from Anatolia to, to, to Greece or to the Aegean. You know, Perles has uh, um, talked and uh, she has uh, really ended up saying that uh, they, they didn't bring the whole stuff while they, they traveled from, from Anatolia. So it's, I don't know, it's the founder's effect or what? what it they, could be. I mean, it, it, it looks be. like both West Anatolia and the Aegean acted uh, as a bottleneck, uh, in fact. It's not like yeah, we see yeah. all, all of the Southwest Asian traits. Uh, it's some selective components. And, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but I don't know, I mean, maybe some people wouldn't agree, but red plaster floors, I don't see it as a random uh, mm -hmm. element of uh, West Anatolian um, sort of uh, invention. Uh, I think mm -hmm. it has its um sort of sources uh, back in the pre-pottery neolithic uh, period uh, and you know in Ain Ghazal and also yeah, in yeah, the Anatolian right. sites and when you compare these floors they are very special technology it's not like it's not just mm -hmm. uh you know uh, a plaster it's more than that uh, and it, it's it's very 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 labor intensive and it requires so much work etc so I always you know I think um there is uh, there's some sort of special conceptualization behind these buildings and behind these uh, the use of uh, color of red that it's not just random you know um, decoration. So uh, Tiller, what, what you mean is it's not the technique, the plaster technique, it's the color. Both is of this, them. <laughs> because if plaster floor we have um, in six thousand site six thousand BC sites. But these are these are up in, pitch, up in Thrace. Um, uh, these are thick uh, plaster floors. They can be uh, up to lime, lime plaster, lime plaster floors. Yeah, yes, lime yes, plaster floors. Exactly. Yeah. Um, at Ulujak, for instance, they're one centimeter thick, but they can go to eight centimeter or twelve centimeters. So this is some sort of a very special uh, mm -hmm. technology that was um, yeah used mm -hmm. mostly by PPN groups, but it also infiltrated, I think, uh, into Western uh, Turkey. Uh, but not in Aegean. I mean, I agree totally with uh, Mary Steiner. In fact, uh, what she said reminded me of also the Cypriot uh, Neolithic, where they take all the animals with them uh, at first, but mm -hmm. uh, until up uh, after 7000 BC or so, there is no more cattle uh, on the island. Yeah, that's right. In yeah, fact, yeah. They, they, they tried mm -hmm. to establish this this uh, familiar ecological uh, habitat on the island, which they brought from the Levant, but it was not possible uh, uh, to breed uh, cattle uh, on Cyprus. It was too expensive, and they just That's gave right, up yes. uh, mm. cattle. So it's possible that when you know people arrived to the Aegean, they also brought with them what they knew uh, as the common way of living, but the local conditions may have not. Uh, um, you know, allowed uh, for this mm -hmm. sort of uh, familiar lifestyle to continue, so they had to change or adapt. So I agree that's very possible also for Frankfurt, um, 
uh, the in terms of ecology of the property. Yeah, I agree. I agree, uh, Chile. Yeah. Who else wants to contribute? Eleni, are you ready? I am ready for you, Nikos. Yeah, go, come on, go on, Eleni. Chile, thank you very much for this exciting presentation. I learned quite a lot through it, and that's my always my main motivation for attending, but also it gives me food for thought. And I would like, let me check, I think I took some notes. I would like to start my, I apologize, long question. <laughs> Maybe you want to take some of your notes <laughs> in the process. <laughs> That's fine. Okay. I found your Western Anatolian Neolithization slide so interesting to the extent that I grabbed the snapshot of it, I admit, in public. And that was to facilitate my own thinking while listening to everybody else and especially your conclusions and the discussion so far. In it, you have identified an encounter phase, an establishment phase, and flourishment phase, and an abandonment phase. And there is the yellow line in there representing Greece, let's say the Aegean basin on past the West Anatolian uh, coast uh, that starts at about 7,400, right? Calibrated PC. Yes, I'm trying to check the slide right now. So <laughs> yes. Okay. And suddenly it struck me, and you know, I don't double much in a Zian prehistory apart from occasional encounters with Frank the Cave, but it suddenly struck me that this slide represents a linear sequence okay, of phases that I suspect have to do with key, or not I suspect, it's obvious on the slide, that have to do with key components usually identified with the process of neolithization, right? So you have sedentism, okay? And then you have the first non-native species appearing, and then you have the rapid dispersal events and so on and so on. Yeah. One thing though that seems to be missing from there, and probably for good reasons, because the slide is titled, is titled West Anatolian Neolithization, is environmental change during this period, okay? For example, the line, the, the yellow line again, representing Greece starts about 7,400, which is the establishment phase, which is the beginning of the colonization of what is called today Greece. You have evidence in Knossos, you have evidence in Franchi, you have evidence in elsewhere in the north. But this is also the time when what we know as the coastal landscapes of Greece had changed utterly and permanently mm -hmm. and irreversibly. And I would argue on the case of Frank, based on the case of Frank that I have studied more closely, very, very quickly. You know, frankly, was com the, the wider landscape of Franci was completely inundated. So that, and we know that now from the charcoal data and from detailed uh, plotting of the botanical data that the resource base of these communities, and we can now compare very well pre and Neolithic and Neolithic uh, landscape resources, it was like day with night, okay? There was a, a literally an environmental catastrophe that hit these communities that had started slowly already from, you know, 
the late Paleolithic period, but accelerated substantially mm -hmm. with the start of the Holocene. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking if perhaps our classic conceptualization of Neolithization as a linear process is somewhat misleading in this respect. And why I, I am saying this, you showed earlier a slide separating views between autochthonous, diffusionist, and in the middle somewhere, stuck the integrationist views, okay? Maybe even this categorization is also completely misleading, okay? Because instead of questioning whether there was colonization during the Neolithic, which certainly there, were, there was, okay? And whether there was an autochthonous development, we have to start thinking about much more complex processes. And we, this is where I come to your Neolithization slide, because you talked earlier about the ninth millennium. Now we know that the ninth millennium in the Aegean is the Mesolithic period, right? And we know that there was ninth millennium in France, just as there were earlier millennia. Okay, it is very interesting that, you know, really there isn't much evidence for things coming. That actually requires an explanation. There isn't much evidence for things coming from the other side of the Aegean onto the Greek mainland earlier than they did, okay? Considering the importance of million obsidian, gradual importance increasing during this period. And it might be a, a, a useful springboard to start thinking not just as to what was the sequence of distinctive Neolithic things and the timeline for them appearing across the Circum Aegean region, but why such things and such evidence, such evidence of networking and interactions did not happen earlier. And I suspect that there might be evidence for that, that is long gone. That's a, an argument that has been rehearsed many times in the past, and I don't wish to take the autochthonous uh, route to, you know, uh, self-destruction here. But I suspect that there was probably quite a long history of, of, of interactions that were not so much contacts, but rather barriers to contact earlier on. And it is interesting that it took these catastrophic sea level rises for the Aegean to open up to Neolithization via the sea routes. I don't know if I'm making myself completely clear in this process. I'm still, you know, have a lot of ideas in, in my head, but it is ah. interesting that, you know, sea level, sea level rise, you know, brought the demise, if you want, of Mesolithic cultures, communities, traditions in many parts of the Aegean, Frank is a typical example of that. They gradually lost all their resource base, all their landscapes. You know, we know that in the Neolithic, they exploited very different vegetation habitats compared to what they had available in pre-Neolithic uh, periods. But at the same time, they opened up the pathways for things to come from the East in the form, if you want, of colonization, you know, um, into the rest of the Aegean. And this is interesting because I think here we can see two distinctive pathways. We can see that possibly where, you know, seaways were the way for the Neolithic to spread out of the so-called core, core regions 
into to the West, you know, sea level rise enabled that, okay? But at the same time, it might have interrupted other processes and completely brought, you know, change that was revolutionary, you know? And then you have to compare, instead of grabbing, sub, sub, subsuming together, places like Franthi or Knossos with places like, you know, Western Anatolia where land routes were the, one of the possible, you know, pathways through which animals, plants could reach Western Anatolian sites. Maybe there is a clear divergence there in the pathways of neolithization. Possibly. So in that sense, I'm not trying to make an autochthonous versus a diffusionist. Artist, no, 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 I understand. Yeah, we really need to consider the impact of environmental change and the opportunities and barriers. Absolutely. Uh, I'm really sorry. I actually, all of my presentation lacked any environmental, ecological <laughs> data. And uh, for the Aegean, this is so important. We were just discussing with Nikos, you know, which islands were connected to the mainland during the Epipaleolithic, we still don't know. Um, we have very little information and data or maps we use all the time. Um, but of course, it is, it is a very, very rapid process of sea level rise. And we do not know as of yet what the impact uh, looked like uh, on the local Mesolithic communities and this is a point I uh, I totally miss uh, and I will I will think about this uh, secondly those four stages they look like linear uh, stages but they're not there is really very little connection between them because as I said we have so huge gaps in between and it is impossible for us right now to connect you know these stages with, with each other. <laughs> Um, they're just there and they look like what the evidence shows us from very few key sites. So they can change, they can be revised, they can be discarded, but uh, it looks like there is a trend, at least starting with 7,000 BC, that you know, more and more what we would typically call Neolithic uh, appearing in the region in, in very many uh, sites in West Anatolia. Um, it's not same as the Aegean, and I think also there is a divergence, definitely, already, perhaps uh, with the earliest dispersal phase, already there is a divergence, I think, and maybe these um, variability I talked about, there is not always the patterns, and uh, there's all sorts of different sorts of things going on, uh, perhaps this was the reason um, why West Anatolia and the Aegean um, diverged in two distinct directions and they were not always corresponding to each other. And this is true also for the later uh, Neolithic periods. Um, we, for instance, we do not have the painted pottery in Western Anatolia, um, but we have it all over the place in Thessaly and things like that. So it's not like West Anatolia and uh, Greece or mainland Greece or the islands are always uh, corresponding. On the contrary, they show very different uh, cultural trajectories um, during the prehistory, but also in the later times. So yes, absolutely, that it's not linear. Um, no way it's linear. I mean, the evidence shows just the contrary, uh, but the ecological impact of sea level rise, uh, that's mm -hmm. something new I need to think about. And thank you so much for pointing uh, this out. And I missed this uh, completely. Mm, and submerged landscapes, <laughs> maybe Nikos would like to uh, add. Yeah, to, uh, submerged, uh, submerged landscapes are very, very important. I think uh, we can rely on uh, models, general models about the general uh, sea level rise. We have to have some uh, specific case studies in order to understand the rate uh, of uh, sea rise uh, and also the response of people, the response of people to that uh, sea level rise. So in that, uh, 
in that case, I think we have to go back to and do some more um, uh, work on the ground in order to understand what uh, really happened. And, uh, uh, you know, just a, a short comment on Eleni's uh, um, comment. Um, oh, I, I fully agree that the paleo environment is very important, but, uh, you, you know, it, it depends uh, how you use these evidence. It's not the answer to everything. I mean, different uh, uh, types of, of sites, they have diff different choices to make. So um, it, it depends how people use these, uh, the evidence, uh, use the environment, natural environment. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not sure that this, this could be the answer to all our um, worries. Eleni? Nikos, I never suggested that this could be the answer to all our worries, questions, problems, etc. But there is a reason why Frank the Cave remains a key reference site in the prehistory of the Eastern Mediterranean, which is that yes, it, it, even though it is an old excavation that was completed many, many, many years ago, it had a remarkable concentration of scientific expertise. It still provides materials that we get the chance to study many, many <laughs> decades after the original publications appeared. And that is the issue here, that sites right. with good recovery, preservation, et cetera, provide us with opportunities to look at the material residues of I fully people agree. environment interactions. Sea level change in itself would mean nothing in the context of Franchi. Anyone, any geologist or you know, environmental scientist could do off-site work establishing a general pattern. It acquires meaning in the case of Franchi because we are able to compare, for example, the archaeobotanical results or the anthropological results and set them against the evidence for sea level change. And they are see that actually environmental change had a direct impact in people's choices of what plants they would gather, which plants they would collect as fuel, and how these cho choices change through time. So this is how environmental change gets meaning in archaeological terms not by offering a dictum or, a, or a, a new, you know, canon to observe, but by offering a background against which we can collect what is in a sense archaeological data. That's it. This is why Frankly is so meaningful in this respect. Yes, but we should never forget that Frankly is a cave and cave has its own problems taphonomic problems. I don't say that, uh, you know, the, the study uh, leads you to the wrong results, but, but we have to, you know, I, I would have a joy to have a, an open air site where all these the different layers are. Can, can I just been, say there that there, are, there have been open air sites <laughs> in the Aegean? No. All yeah. the islands that were never sampled, or they were poorly, very poorly sampled. But let's not let's not get down that route of discussion right now. Anyway, so, yes, uh, uh, I think Professor Watkins wants yes. to. Uh, I'm so sorry for it. <laughs> uh, I I I very much enjoyed uh, your 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 talk, Julia, and I I learned a lot. Well, one uh, part of your talk really. Uh, um, uh, made my imagination uh, uh, um, take off. And that's your encounter phase. Yeah, uh, I, I was. Uh, I had not really thought about that at all. The the arrival of of uh, uh, the first non uh, uh, native uh, uh, species is happening at a time when further east they're uh, they're in their first domestic. So as soon as there are domesticated animals and domesticated species way back uh, uh, in the uh, hilly flank zone, top of, north, of the, north of the Levant, 
they're beginning to appear uh, um, uh, in in the west of in the west of Turkey. That seems to me to have two implications. One is uh, we know that something similar is happening with Cyprus, which is a lot closer to the mainland, uh, uh, to the Western Asian mainland than, than the west of uh, Anatolia. And there they're arriving in bits and pieces. Yeah? They don't come as a package, they come successively, yeah? And, as, uh, and, and not always successfully. Uh, um, but I wondered if I could ask you to say a little bit more about this, the encounter phase, uh, because I'm, I'm you know, fascinated by the idea that there must have been people in the Western Anatolia, your, your, your people there, must have been interested in receiving these things, yeah, uh, and they we didn't. It's 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 pre Amazon. There's no there's no online booking and no long ordering service. They they couldn't uh, look them up online and, and order them and, and bingo, they're delivered next day. Amazon Prime. They 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 must have been brought by people, yeah. So there must have been uh, um, actual physical encounters of of people who had some of this new technology and these new uh, materials. Uh, can Absolutely. you just say a little bit more about the encounter? I'm fascinated by this phase. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> what I imagined is, is similar to what you said, in fact. And um, these non-native species, we're not sure whether in the ninth millennium they arrived as a package um, because we have very little evidence and we do not know the extent of the uh, cereals and pulses that were circulating in this part of uh, Anatolia in late 9th millennium BC, but from the few evidence we have from both central Anatolian sites like Bonjuklu uh, and Ashiklu and from the new uh, excavated site of Girmeler, um, it, it appears as a possibility that in late 9th millennium BC already uh, this uh, maritime route was activated and it was used in all sorts of directions. It's not just you know, from east to west, uh, in all sorts of directions. And there um, people existed. Now we know that Mesolithic people uh, were present, already foragers were present in, in Western Anatolia. And when uh, there was this demographic movement, uh, maybe it was very thin, you know, very, very few people were moving, uh, but still there were, I think there were encounters, physical encounters, as you said, and then that, that people interacted and that people exchanged uh, technologies um, and also this sort of, you know, plants and perhaps animals. Uh, we need more uh, faunal and floral data to see whether this was really the case, but uh, this would be something uh, I would imagine that was happening uh, before uh, the seventh millennium BC uh, and Southwest Asian groups, uh, they were on the move, not um, massively, uh, but they were um, sort of exploring uh, the area, uh, maybe for resources or raw materials, but they were, you know, uh, getting themselves familiar with the region and perhaps then establishing uh, new sites or campsites, uh, etc. So this is the kind of thing I was uh, thinking when I said about the encounter phase, but this could go uh, much earlier, you know, uh, perhaps during the Epipaleolithic, there were already encountering each other. And this is something, again, I see at Ökuzini. At Ökuzini, we see some uh, very typical Natufian uh, materials, like symbolic uh, items, like these uh, incised pebbles or some, mm. uh, you know, these uh, shell beads, etc., and not to mention the lithics. It's so similar to the Natufian world, in fact, you could say that they're not the same, but they're interacting. So um, it is possible uh, this encounter uh, were, were happening already and these routes were established even in the late uh, Epipaleolithic period along the southern uh, coast. Uh, and during the Neolithic, it just continued. Um, and then uh, the movement uh, of animals, plants and all sorts of technologies uh, became possible and people were just enjoying, you know, like uh, exchanging uh, stuff. So uh, regardless of whether they're locals or non-locals. Uh, so and this was the sort of um, sort of thing that I was imagining.